All right, welcome back. Now that lecture on Hartree Field was a little tough. The reading was a little tough. Um, for Penelope and Maddie, I managed to find a reading that was taken from a more popular type book um, on philosophy. So I think it's an easier read. Uh, this will be a shorter, more straightforward lecture. Um, I think because of that, there are some questions left open that if, if we read you know, her book, we might uh, she might answer in more detail. But I think you get the general gist of her to, uh, the status, the ontological status of numbers. So she starts with uh, the argument, an argument for Platonism, which is basically Quine's singular term argument, right? She, she says, look, basic arithmetic, arithmetic, right, when you learn it in elementary school, tells us that there is a number between three and five. There is a number between the three and five that seems to imply that the number four exists, right? We're using the number four as a singular term, or we're talking about it. As, as though it's you know like a table or a chair, right? But unlike tables or chairs, we don't ever trip over the number four. You don't have to put the number four in your bag when you're headed to math class. So if the number four exists, right, as arithmetic seems to apply, imply, um, it's not a physical object, so it must be something else. And that something else is that it's an abstract object, right, whatever those are. And as an aside, we've never gotten a a great account of what abstract objects are. We have, we're told what they aren't, right? There are things that exist that aren't physical, that aren't spatiotemporal, that aren't causally related to our world. Um, we don't hear a lot about what they are, right? And I, I've never heard of the answer to that. Okay, so Maddie disputes this claim. She says numbers do exist, right? But they don't have to be abstract objects, which are sort of mysterious. Um, numbers can be just physical objects, and she's going to explain. It work. So first of all, um, we do encounters, encounter numbers in everyday physical context all the time, right? So um, we'll see three apples on a table, five fingers on each hand, um, nine players on a baseball diamond. So of course the five fingers are not the number five, right? So if it's not an encounter with the number five itself, at least it's an encounter with numbering, with the act of numbering, right? Um, and when you were a little kid, this was much more obvious, right? You you see uh, a bunch of fingers and you actually have to count them one, two, three, four, five before you know the number, right? Um, you know, but when a child counts their fingers, are they counting abstract objects? Well, obviously not, right? They're counting fingers, right? This is how we encounter numbers in, in everyday life. So what are we doing when we're counting or numbering? Well, she says we're pointing out, for example, we're counting apples on a table. We're counting out that there is an apple-shaped conglomeration of molecules here, right? And another such conglomeration here, and another one here. And then after that, there aren't any more such conglomerations on the table, right? So if I'm counting three apples, that's basically what I'm doing. Um, again, I'm not counting abstract objects at all. Um, it's really, in principle, no different than pointing out the sorts of properties and relations we do all the time in a visual scene. So, you know, a, oh, that baseball player is wearing red, right? That object is north of another object. All kinds of properties we can point out, right? Nate is wearing a blue shirt. So she says counting apples is no different than picking out other properties that objects have. We're just describing a situation, you know, on a table or whatever. Um, of course, we do sometimes count non-physical things. So in a story, if a genie grants three wishes, we can count those wishes. Um, but I mean, so long as we can describe the relation, we can number them. So we could say that the apples on the table have the property of being three, right? Um, but recall the singular term argument, right? The argument was the claim that there is a number between three and five. It doesn't talk about number properties. It uses the number as a singular term, right? But she says, Basically, we can sort of retranslate our sentences about numbers into the language of properties, right? So instead of saying there's a number between three and five, we could say properties of threeness are between properties of twoness and fourness, right? And so on. Um, this is something metaphysicians do sometimes, right? If they don't want to commit to the existence of something, they could say, look, when we say there's a number between two and four, that's just sort of shorthand. What we really mean to say 
is that the property of threeness is between the property of twoness and fourness, right? Maybe, right? Um, likewise, when we say things like two plus two equals four, uh, maybe what we really mean to say, right, if we were being careful about our ontology would be, if you have a bunch of objects with the property of twoness and another similar bunch, then you have a bunch of objects with the property of fourness. Maybe that's what we mean, right? If that is what we meant, right? Or if that's a reasonable translation, um, then maybe we don't have to commit to the existence of numbers. We only have to exist, commit to the existence of properties. So obviously, um, you know, arithmetic gets more and more complex. And, and the question is, can all such uh, statements be translated, right, in terms of properties instead of, or do we need numbers? So she gives some examples, right? So for example, um, right, n plus m equals n plus n. Um, you could translate that as the result of combining a bunch of stuff with number property n with another bunch of stuff with number property m is a bunch of stuff that has the same number property as a bunch of, that is the result of combining a bunch of stuff with the number property m with a bunch of stuff with the number property m. Uh, one of those should have been an n in there. I <laughs> think I already screwed it up. Um, but you get the idea, right? Um, so a, a kind of similar to Fields' approach, right, where he wanted to reformulate science without using numbers, you could do it. It's just a real pain in the butt, right, and you end up with some very long, complicated sentences. Same thing here. You could translate all of arithmetic into talking instead of talking about numbers, talking about number properties, um, and you know it'll work. It's just annoying. Now, one worry for the claim that numbers are physical things, right, is that uh, for any number, there is another number after it, right? The, n the numbers are infinite. Um, but there is not an infinite number of physical objects. A uh, no. whole heck of a lot of physical objects, right? Particularly if you count individual atoms or whatever. But it does stop somewhere, right? It's not an infinite number. It's just an incredibly large number. So just like, right, the argument that um, numbers can't be ideas, right? The argument against conceptualism was, look, even though there's a a ton of ideas out there in the world, they're not infinite, right? It stops somewhere. Same with physical objects. Even though there's a ton of physical objects out there, it stops somewhere and numbers don't stop anywhere, right? They're infinite. Um, so what can Maddie say about this? Um, well, she says, look, we have this belief that numbers go on forever, right? And she thinks it's a result of a psychological mechanism re related to language. So, since we know how in principle you could sort of combine number words like nine and trillion and thousand and so on and always produce a new number because of that process we assume that in principle a new number could always be generated even though in reality no one would ever count that high right so no one's ever going to count um well certainly they can't count to an infinite right number and, and uh, then there's there's a limit to how high you can any human can count right um, so what is what is your point there? I, it's not entirely clear to me, right? There's a couple things she might be trying to say. Is she saying that numbers are psychological, right? In a sense, right? Because the the reason we think numbers are infinite is because of some psychological tendency we have, or is she trying to say that numbers actually aren't infinite, right? Um, that would seem to contradict contradict the acts the piano axioms. Of arithmetic. Um, later, she kind of tries to say that there's really no fact of the matter about whether numbers are infinite. Um, so I don't know. This this seems like, and again, this is not like a, a, one of her works that she published in a journal or as a book, right? This is sort of a more popular kind of book. So maybe she has to be a little fuzzy here, um, but it feels a little too fuzzy. It's not clear what she's saying. About it. it does seem to be a substantive issue. Uh, the numbers are physical things, just as it is a, an objection to the claim that numbers are, cons are ideas, right? There's just not enough ideas or physical things to map onto all the numbers. Okay, but anyways, moving on. She says, look, numbers exist, but in just in the same way that properties like redness exist. So now the problem of getting rid of or nominalizing numbers is the same problem as nominalizing properties, right? 
Now, if you think you can't do that, right, if you believe the one over many argument, then yeah, numbers are going to be abstract objects just like universals are. Um, but, you know, if you're like Quine and you think ostrich nominalism is a good approach, um, then you can get right then um, it's just sort of a brute fact that things, some things are red and it's a brute fact that some things are twos. The property of tunis, and you stop there. So this is sort of the last slide. I said this would be a relatively short. So I did say, you know, it's a little unsatisfying what she said about the problem of there being infinite numbers. She talks a little bit more about it, and so she explores the possibility that maybe there's just no fact of the matter about the status of mathematical claims like the numbers are infinite. Can't have a physical basis, right? infinite physical things. So she talks about um, a particular state of matter that water can enter, enter into if it freezes like very, very quickly. And it's not quite like ice, it's got a slightly different structure. And there's really no consensus on scientists. Like they know the whole process, they understand what it is. It's not, it's not mysterious or anything. They just can't decide on the terminology. Should we call this ice, right? Or should we call it something else? Um, and she says, you know, in the end, it doesn't really matter what we call it. Everyone agrees on the facts. Everyone understands the process, right? It's just a sort of a terminological dispute, you know. Um, and Maddie wants to say, well, the claim that numbers are infinite, you know, whether that's true or not, or whether an infinity, infinity of numbers exists, um, she says that doesn't really matter that much, right? Um, we agree on the important parts, all the stuff that makes numbers useful, and so we don't have to worry about that, and we can still be physicalists about numbers. Um, find that satisfying? Um, I'll leave it up to you. Seems to be possibly an interesting paper topic. Uh, all right, so trying to give you a little break here at the end of the week since the, the other papers may have been a little difficult. Uh, yep, that's it.